Good morning, Church Alive. Good morning, good morning. I am excited to worship our King this morning. Would you stand to your feet? And let's just begin to give him praise, God. We are excited to be in your house this morning, Lord. We honor you this morning, and we dedicate this time to you. We sing to you, our King.
scripture this morning, and it was going to be for later, but we're going to go ahead and read it now. In Revelation 4 and 8, it says, Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over, inside and out. Day and after day and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're going to say that right now. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The one who always was, who is, and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is to come. That is a scripture he gave me. We've been just watching events happen, and we know the Lord is on his way. But what's so powerful about it is that it says he was, who is, and he still is to come. And that's what these songs all that we're going to sing today represent. I want to join with the heavenly host this morning and pronounce that he is holy. I believe that Satan is vanquished and Jesus is our king. That is my belief this morning. The Lord has been taking me through the book of Leviticus. And it's so interesting how they put so much emphasis on how holy God is and what they had to do because he was holy and we are not. We need to have that same emphasis today. He is holy. When we enter this house, he is holy. When we're in our places of work, he is holy. When we're at home, he's still holy. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is the king. He is holy. Can we just praise him right now? Can we join the heavenly hosts and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Jesus, we worship you today, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We can look to you, the author and the finisher of our hope, and we can have confidence this morning 
that what we are singing about is true, that you are coming soon, and we worship you, Jesus. This morning for our prayer focus, I felt it important for us this morning to take a moment and that we would pray for each other. Scripture says that if any of us have need in the church, let the elders of the church lay hands on each other and pray for each other. And so this is going to require a little bit of movement participation for you this morning because we're a little bit spread out across the sanctuary. But I want you to find somebody that you can either join hands with or place your hand on their shoulder. And as we pray this morning, we're not going to pray for ourselves, but we're going to pray for each other in church. And you may not know what the need is of the individual that you are praying for, but you can pray for the blessing of the Spirit of God to come upon them and for their needs to be met. So I want you to begin to move right now and find somebody that you can join with this morning and pray over them as we go before the throne of God today. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning, and we lift up our brothers and sisters in this house. We lift up their needs before you, God. We know, Father, that even though we may not be aware of all of the intricacies that are going on in people's lives right now, Father, that you have been with them every step of their week, Lord. You have been with them every breath that they have breathed this week, and you have a blessing and a portion specifically for them right now, Father. I pray that you would open the windows of heaven right now over our church, Father, and that your spirit would begin to pour out, Lord, that you would provide the healing, Lord, that you would provide the peace, that you would provide the provision, that you would provide the wisdom and the discernment, Father. Father God, that you would fall on your people this morning and that you would see to every need, Lord, because you are the God who makes a way where there is no way. You are a God that shows up at just the right time. You are the God who provides rivers in the wasteland. You are the God who parts the Red Sea with the Egyptians at our back, Lord, and you are well able this morning to meet our needs. We give you glory and honor this morning. We place our confidence and our trust and our hope in you this morning. We are steadfast and secure. We are rooted in you this morning, Jesus, and we are looking to you, Father. You are welcome in this place. Come and speak to us, Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.
And the 
all we need to say. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above the all. All the roads and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All the roads and dominions, all powers. Your name stands above them all. Jesus. Jesus. We speak your name this morning, Jesus. For your name is the name that stands above every other name. It is at your name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Hallelujah. It is at your name that every stronghold must fall. It is at your name that every lie must be revealed. It is at your name that every addiction must break. It is at your name that every sickness must be healed. It is at your name that deliverance comes. So we speak the name of Jesus. 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 We speak the name of Jesus this morning. Oh, I believe that we just need to speak the name of Jesus in faith over some things this morning, church. Not pastors speaking the name of Jesus for you, but you speaking the name of Jesus over your situation. You speaking the name of Jesus over what you may be facing. The Lord reminded me this last week as I've been walking through a difficult situation and asking for the Lord to show up and deliver. He reminded me that as a son of God, I have authority that I can speak the name of Jesus and the enemy has to flee, that I can speak the name of Jesus and strongholds have to be broken, but that I can also speak the name of Jesus and blessing is released, that I can speak the name of Jesus and healing can come about, that I can speak the name of Jesus and deliverance can arrive. So I believe right now we just need to speak the name of Jesus. Whatever it is that you're facing right now, I want you to speak the name of Jesus over it. I want you to rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus. I want you to release the favor of heaven in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we call on you this morning. We call on the name, the creator of the heavens and the earth. We call on the name of Jesus who was and is and is yet to come. And we declare that Jesus has all authority. You are in the room this morning, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would break every stronghold in the name of Jesus. That you would bring healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. the 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are near to us this morning, that we can call on your name, and you are right beside us. We recognize that you are in the room this morning, Jesus, and we ask, Father, that as we transition into our giving and into your word, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us, that your name would have all authority in this place today, Lord that you would remove every distraction, that you would remove our flesh, Lord, and that your name would speak to us today, Jesus. Have your way this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. We are going to continue our worship through our giving of our tithes and our offering. And with it being fourth Sunday, we are giving towards our general expense fund. And I'm going to share a little bit of a testimony later on in my sermon. But the Lord reminded me this week that all of the times he prompted me to give in an offering over the last 12 months and The Lord and I would have a little bit of a back and forth about, Lord, are you sure that that is the amount that you want me to give? You know what the bank account looks like. You know what the finances are. And yes, that's and that's what I want you to give. He reminded me that over the last 12 to 24 months, as I've been faithful in that, that this week he poured out his blessings in a great financial way. And he reminded me that giving, while it often brings about blessing for you and I, is not actually about the blessing for you and I. It's about God getting the glory. And when the people of God give sacrificially, God gets the glory. When we give above what is reasonable, above what is logical, God gets the glory. Because then God takes that sacrifice of our giving that sacrifice of our obedience, and he does something magnificent with it, and it points back to his name. And it points to others that he does have all authority, that he does have all ability to provide for his people. And so our giving this morning is not something that we do out of obligation. It's not something that we do to check off a box for our Christianity, but our giving is actually ascribing glory to Jesus Christ. That name that we just sang about, it says he is above all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. His name stands above it all. When we give of our finances, we are putting actions to what we've just sung about. That he is above all and he is worthy of everything that we can give unto him. And when we participate in giving through worship, we are giving glory back to the name of Jesus. As our ushers come this morning, you have four ways that you can participate in your worship through giving. You can place your offering in the plate as they pass it through the sanctuary. You can text 84321 for instructions to give online. You can find our online giving link on our Facebook page and website, or if you're watching today on the live stream, you can even mail your tithes and offering to our clerk and treasurer, Sister Judy Hatton. Will you pray with me over the offering? Father God, I thank you for your presence that is with us this morning. I thank you, Lord, that we can call on the name of Jesus, and we can ascribe glory to your name, and you meet here with us as your people. Father, I pray that you would help us now to be obedient in our giving and our worship, to give glory unto your name through our finances and through our sacrifice. Lord, receive this offering into your house. Press it down, shake it together, and pour it out for your kingdom that many would come to know you through this offering. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
thank you for your giving. I'm going to ask that you be standing one more time this morning before we settle in for the word. Take the word of God in your hand. Turn with me to the New Testament, to the book of James. We're going to look at James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. And the title of my sermon this morning is Uncomfortable Christianity. Our passage starts in James chapter 1, verse 22. And it says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. I'm going to read that part again. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Will you pray with me over the word? Father God, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your presence that has already come into the room. We invite you, Father, now to open our hearts and open our minds and to speak directly into our spirits, Lord. Let us hear from heaven and receive from you today. Lord, I pray for your anointing upon me, Lord, that it would not be my thoughts or my heart that goes forward this morning, but that I would be your vessel in your mouth's peace, speaking for you today. Father, come and meet with us today that we may be molded to be more like you as we hear from your spirit and your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And although the title of the sermon is Uncomfortable Christianity, you can get comfortable for a moment. A few years ago at work, um, while I was still a teacher, I was asked to participate in something called safe crisis management training. As a general education teacher, I had the pleasure of welcoming into my classroom students who had um, what is called an emotional disability, who sometimes struggle with self-regulation skills and coping skills and things that would um, not cause us to be distressed or cause most individuals to have an outburst of anger. It they were a little bit more sensitive to. And this training of safe crisis management, it largely deals, most of it deals with just strategies for dealing with children who have experienced early childhood trauma because it rewires their brains and it causes them to think differently and act differently. And so as an educator, you also must learn how to think and act differently in response to these students. But then the last 10 to 15 percent of the training, it teaches educators and teachers how to intervene physically if in a moment a student reaches a point of crisis where they become a danger to themselves or they become a danger to someone else in the room. This, of course, is always the last resort option for any educator, <coughs> but it is important for some educators in a school building to be trained to know how to intervene in a moment of crisis so that everybody remains safe. So I got to go to this training, and I actually got to become one of the trainers for the district. And it was a 40-hour training that I had to go through. It was eight hours a day, five days a week for one full week. And the first two days, we focused mostly on the theory, the de-escalation strategies. But then Tuesday afternoon going into Wednesday, we started practicing the physical aspect of this training. And we would sit through the, the instruction part of it. They would tell us what it sounded like, what it looked like in theory. We would read about it in our uh, manual. But then they would say, okay, get up from the tables and all of the adults go to the back of the room. Now we're going to practice these physical interventions. We had received the written instructions, the verbal instructions, but then we had to practice them. We had to actually do what we had been told. We had to put into practice and get used to the physical movements of these physical interventions. Well, when Friday came, a part of getting certified in this is you had to skill out. You had to prove that you not only had a head knowledge, 
of the theories and the practices, but you had to perform all of the physical interventions on another individual. I had the pleasure of doing this on a six foot three, 250 pound um, man that spent a lot of time in the gym. Um, and I don't know um, if you have noticed, but your pastor is not the most um, physically fit individual. I don't spend a lot of time in the gym. So managing this six foot three, 250 pound man was not the easiest thing to do. But because I had listened to the instructions and I had practiced them, I was able to complete the physical intervention. But there were some people that day on that Friday that were not able to skill out. They were not able to perform the physical interventions in order to receive the certification because they had not practiced during the week the things that had been taught to us. Not everyone was doing a good job because they had heard the instructions. They had even read the instructions, but they had not actually gone through the practice of doing the movements and the interventions. There is a correlation here between what I experienced in my school's training and what the Bible is teaching us in, for, in James 1, 22 through 25. The Apostle James is telling us that we must actually do what the Word of God says. I know that may seem like a simple thought for us this morning, but the reality is that if everybody that was a Christian did everything that the Word of God tells us to do, then there wouldn't be as much need for pastoral ministry in the world today. Even sometimes myself, there are parts of the Bible that are difficult to do what the Word says. But James makes it very clear to us, we are to not just be hearers of the word, we are to be doers of the word. When we come to church on Sunday morning and hear the word, when we study the word throughout the week, it is important for us to move past just a head knowledge and an understanding. We must actually put into practice what the word of God is telling us to do. And sometimes as Christians, we can be really good at listening to, reciting scripture verses, and posting about what the Bible says. However, talk is cheap. Actions display obedience and commitment. And when James is talking here in verses 22 through 25, he is not saying do the word when it is easy to do the word. Do the word when it is comfortable to do the word. He is telling the early church and subsequently you and I today that in every moment and in every season, we are to do what the word tells us to do. When the word tells us that vengeance is mine, say it the Lord. When the word tells us to turn the other cheek when others do us wrong. When the word tells us to bless those who curse us and to pray for our enemies. That is the word as well, just as much as I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. We are to be doers and practicers of the entirety of Scripture. And sometimes we will convince ourselves even that though we don't have any intentional sin in our life, that we are being obedient to the word of God. Well, pastor, I am not out here sinning. I'm not cussing. I'm not drinking. I'm not lying. I'm not stealing. I've got the Ten Commandments on lock. But the absence of intentional sin in our lives is not the same thing as being obedient to the whole of God's word. You can be living a good life and yet not actually being obedient to everything that the word teaches us to do. We must be students of the word, but we must be doers of the word as well. And scripture makes it very clear to us in this passage, we fool ourselves when we do not practice the word of God. It is one thing to be tricked by someone else, but to deceive yourself, the Bible says, that is foolish. The Apostle James likens it to looking at yourself in the mirror at the beginning of the day in the morning and getting the hair, your hair in the perfect spot and making sure that there are no blemishes on your face and your shirt looks nice and you are ready to go and then immediately stepping away from the mirror and having no idea what you look like. That is the level of foolishness Christians display when they hear the word, they say amen to the word, they memorize the word, but they do not practice the word of God. And sometimes doing the word, being obedient to us, gets us uncomfortable. So why would the Bible, why would we do what the Bible tells us? As James is 
prompting us to do? Well, first of all, if we believe in the Bible and we believe in Jesus, then we believe that Jesus has saved us from our sins, that he lived a perfect life, that he died, he was buried, he was resurrected, so that you and I could have a relationship with him and access to eternal life. And if we really believe that in our heart and in our being, that someone would do something so magnificent for us, then we should be placing our trust in him and being obedient to everything that he has instructed us to do, which we find in his word. Secondly, this same scripture verse makes it very plain by telling us that practicing the word of God sets us free and blesses us. Sometimes there is a misconception about being obedient to the word of God that it restricts us to the point of, well, we just can't have any fun and there's no joy and there's no excitement. That's a lie of the enemy because the word actually tells us that when we are obedient to the word, that it is the word in relationship with Jesus that sets us free and opens the windows of blessing. And I have talked with a lot of young people throughout our years in youth ministry, and they're like, I just don't know if I'm ready to serve the Lord because it doesn't sound like very much fun. Because right now, if I'm not serving the Lord, I can do what I want. I can say what I want. I can go where I want. I can do whatever I want because I'm just being honest. I'm not serving the Lord. But I'm telling you, there is a freedom and there is a blessing in being obedient to the word of the Lord that cannot be experienced outside of obedience to the word. But I want to be clear this morning. Obedience can be uncomfortable. You see, that week that I was in that training for safe crisis management, I got very uncomfortable. As I mentioned before, I'm not a gym rat. I don't exercise on a regular basis. And so when I was physically managing that six foot three, 250 pound man, and I was having to restrain his physical movement, I was having to take him from a standing position to a seated position. I was having to do things so that he could not move as freely as he wanted to. My body was not accustomed to that type of physical activity. So about Thursday, when I was walking into that training center, and it was on the second floor, and I had to go up those steps, I became keenly aware of every muscle in my body that had been used as I was practicing these physical interventions. As I went to sit down on the chair at the table, I became very aware that my body was growing uncomfortable because of the physical training that I was going through that week. But yet the uncomfortability of the training was a requirement to be able to perform the task that needed to be done by the end of the week. If I had not gone through the process of allowing my body to be uncomfortable, I would never have been able to perform the skills required by the training. Sometimes in our Christianity and in our practice of the word of God, it requires us to get a little bit uncomfortable in order to get to the place where Jesus is calling us to be. In order to be fully obedient to what he's asking us to do, sometimes we have to get uncomfortable in our daily routines and our practices of the word of God so that we can get from point A to point B. But all too often in modern Christianity, we are more inclined to a comfortable Christianity. We like the blessings of Scripture. We like the provision of the word of God. We like the deliverance and the healing. But when the word tells us to do something that's a little bit uncomfortable, we tend to pass by that part of the passage or that part of the book a little bit quicker. But we must understand this morning, discomfort is a necessity for us to be obedient to all of the instructions of the word. The Apostle Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. The Apostle Paul likened our spiritual walk with the Lord to the actual physical training of an athlete, that we must discipline ourselves to do what is uncomfortable, to do what the word 
asks us to do so that we may actually be true and faithful to the word of God. So that when we go and share Jesus with other people, we are not then turning around and being disobedient to the word of the Lord. It requires a discipline that can get uncomfortable at times. Being obedient to the word of God can cause situational discomfort and some long-term discomfort. But the discomfort is a necessity for us to be obedient to the word of God. And the reality is the discomfort that I experienced the week of that training of Save Crisis Management, I don't feel that discomfort today. I do not still have that soreness in my muscles. I do not still have that restriction of movement that I felt by Friday of that week. But I can tell you with confidence I can perform all of the physical actions that I learned during that week because I went through a short season of being uncomfortable so that I could achieve the task at hand. Sometimes in our relationship with the Lord, we need to go through a season of uncomfortability so that we can become deeper in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and we can be obedient to all of the word, which then the Apostle James says releases the freedom and the blessings of God upon our lives. So let's understand the difference between comfort and discomfort. Comfort is the enemy of effectiveness. When we are comfortable and we are not willing to step out of our comfort zone or do something new or engage in a new habit or task, that is the enemy of effectiveness because it prevents us from getting better at anything. Comfort is stagnant. It remains in one place. One of my favorite pieces of furniture that I've ever owned was my recliner that my parents bought me, I think when I was like 20 or 21. And a few years ago, after Miranda and I got married, it didn't fit in the house, so we got rid of that recliner. But that recliner was a stagnant place of comfort for your pastor. I would go and I would sit in that recliner, and that was my most comfortable place in the house. But I was not in movement. I was not in training. I was not improving anything about my life. I was just sitting in comfort. Comfort is stagnant. Comfort lacks vision and hope. If I'm comfortable with where I am and the way things are right now, I'm never looking for what God wants to do in the future. I am never hopeful for what he may perform in my life or in the lives of those around me because I'm good. I'm comfortable. I'm okay if this is all it ever is. If this is as good as it gets, I'm comfortable with that. It lacks vision and hope. Discomfort, on the other hand, forces us to address weakness. Discomfort, when you are physically training, you will learn where your body is the weakest. You will learn where you need to focus the most attention so that you can strengthen that weak area of your life. Discomfort is focused on the goal. I understand what God wants for me. I understand what God has called me to. I understand where God is leading me. And so I am willing to engage in some uncomfortability in order to get to what God has called me to do. Discomfort propels you forward. Discomfort is on the move. It is progressing. It is forward movement. And we must understand this morning that the Bible never called us to comfortability. In fact, over and over throughout Scripture, we see that those who are called of God experienced great discomfort in order to be obedient to the instructions that God had given them. Moses, Paul, John the Baptist, and even Jesus all spent time in the wilderness alone. Joseph and Paul spent time in prison. David was on the run after being anointed as king. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all prisoners of war in a foreign country. Yet all of these individuals were obedient to the word of God. And through their discomfort, they experienced the blessing and the provision of God Almighty. Jesus even gives us a promise of hope in the midst of discomfort. He tells us in John 16, verse 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, 
but take heart because I have overcome the world. Our Savior has given us the promise that, yes, while we may experience some difficult situations and he may actually call us to some uncomfortableness so that we can grow closer to him, that he is with us every step of the way. And he has already won the battle. He has already defeated Satan. So we can be confident that while we might experience a momentary discomfort, it is moving us closer to the heart of God and obedience to his word. So I believe this morning that there are three areas where Scripture calls us, and there are probably more, but these are the three areas that I want to identify for us this morning as Scripture calls us to live in uncomfortable Christianity. And the first is the discomfort of serving orphans and widows. In Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, Scripture says, But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discomfort. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers. Now, let's just momentarily pause for that. I know that is a completely foreign thought to us that nobody here has ever experienced church people complaining about church people. We're all so holy that that has never been a part of our lived experience. But the early church, they were experiencing church people were complaining about church people. They were saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the 12, the disciples, called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted. I find this passage of Scripture so interesting because it identifies for us the first conflict in the early church. After Jesus has died on the cross, he's been buried, he's been resurrected, he has ascended. This is after the day of Pentecost. This is the very first conflict that we see in the church, and it was surrounding conflict between believers and the distribution of food and how the orphans or the widows were being cared for in the church. There was this disagreement that some of the widows were receiving preference because now the gospel was not just for the Jews. It was not just for the children of Israel, but it was for everyone. And there were some people saying, well, I think that you're taking care of the Jewish speaking widows better than you're taking care of the Greek speaking widows. And there were some Jews that were saying, I think you're actually taking care of the Greek-speaking widows better than the Jewish-speaking widows. And there was this moment of conflict and discord within the early church. And so the apostles, under the wisdom and the direction of the Holy Spirit, appointed seven men who were full of the Spirit of God. Notice that they did not choose men who had nothing else to do. They did not choose men that were just loitering around and had nothing good to do with their time. They prayerfully selected seven men who had proven themselves to be respectable, God-fearing, spirit-filled individuals to minister to the widows of the early church. This was their only responsibility, and Scripture says that it was, in fact, a responsibility. It was not just something that they were passing off to so that they could say, well, we appointed a committee to take care of this. No, these seven men actually engaged in the ministry of making sure that the widows were taken care of. I imagine that there were some first century gutters that were cleaned out by these seven men. 
there were some meals that were cooked in the homes of these seven men, and they carried them to the homes of the widows. There were some times where they just sat with them, and they listened to them cry for their their grief, for their missing husband. There were some times where they went and they prayed with them. These seven men were intentionally ministering to the widows of the early church. To some, this might seem like an inconsequential ministry, but widows have always been of a keen importance throughout the lens of Scripture. Throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament, instructions are given on how to care for widows. And in the day that we live, it's easy for us to become relaxed in our care of widows. We'll convince ourselves the widows have family members to take care of them. Or the widows have governmental assistance that helps care for their needs. But biblically, there is a responsibility of the church to lead the charge on taking care of, seeing to the needs of, and ministering to the widows within our community and with our church. And when we do not take this with a seriousness, it actually inhibits the gospel of Jesus Christ. It actually presents a barrier to the success of a local congregation if that church does not engage in the ministry of widows. We can see this because in verse 7, it tells us that after they had done all of this, God's message continued to spread And the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted as well. It was not just that the disciples had solved the conflict. They were being obedient to the Spirit of God, and they were serving the widows, and it got uncomfortable. They're not typically a long line of individuals who are waiting to say, can I be in the widow ministry of the church? It can be uncomfortable to see to the needs of someone who is not your family member. It can be uncomfortable to sit with someone who has lost their spouse and their loved one and to be an ear to listen and someone to pray with them. That can get us uncomfortable, but it is a responsibility of the church. Scripture declares in James chapter 1, verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. If we want to have a pure and genuine religion, if we want to have a pure and genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, then we must take seriously the command of Scripture to serve orphans and widows, regardless of how uncomfortable it gets, regardless of the financial obligation that it may require from the church, we are to serve orphans and widows. We know additionally that children have a special place in the heart of God because of what we read in Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. This is during Jesus' ministry. And it says, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. Now, obviously, the children in this passage of Scripture are not orphans because it says clearly that their parents were bringing them to Jesus. But it does give us a glimpse into the heart of Jesus and the heart of the Father towards children, where he said, I don't want there to be any barrier to the children coming to me. I don't want there to be any barrier for children receiving the same level of ministry and blessing that the adults in the church are receiving. Let the children come to me. Let them also receive blessing. Let them also receive prayer. We must understand that as the body and the bride of Christ, we have a biblical command to be in service to the orphans and widows of our community. 
And it will require our finances. It will require our time. It will require our emotional investment. And it will require our prayer life. However, it stands as a non-negotiable for the church of Christ. For the church that follows Jesus, for the church that declares that his name is above every other name, above every power and position, every throne and dominion, his word is very clear that we are to be intentional about serving orphans and widows, regardless of how uncomfortable it may get. And I don't preach this as a slap on the wrist to anyone Rather, as a conviction that God has laid on my own heart. That for church alive, for this body of believers, we must be intentional about our ministry to orphans and widows. Secondly, this morning, we must engage in the discomfort of loving the lost. In John chapter 8, scripture records that a woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the church leaders brought this woman out into the streets to be stoned. And they grabbed Jesus, and they were trying to use this moment as an opportunity to trap Jesus. Because these church people wanted to stone and kill this woman for being caught in the act of adultery. Now, just an anecdotal thought, I've always found it interesting that it says she was caught in the act of adultery by church people. Where did they know the act of adultery was going to be taking place and who was going to be involved? We may never know, but I think it's interesting to note that the church people were the ones that caught her in the act of adultery. And they immediately wanted to kill her. And they were trying to trap Jesus into saying, yes, let's kill her. Let me just pause here for a moment. That when someone is caught in the act of sin or someone confesses to an act of sin, it is not the church's primary responsibility to condemn and shame that individual. Rather, it is our job to love them and show them the love of Jesus. Scripture reminds us that we have all sinned. And we have all fallen short of the glory of God. You and I are no more deserving of the grace and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ than individuals who are sinning right now. So when we encounter individuals who are in sin, they are deep into it. They are bound and they are shackled and they are overcome by the weight of their sin and their addictions and their problems. Our primary responsibility is not to condemn them. Or to shame them. Our job is to love them right where they are. And that gets uncomfortable. There will be a lot of church people that will say, or a lot of Christians that will say, well, we just can't, we can't condone sin, Pastor. If we if we just love them right where they're at, then it's like we're just putting a a rubber stamp on their actions and their sin. No, it's not. Do not allow the enemy to convince you that loving someone right where they are at is a free pass or an affirmation of the choices that they are making or the life that they are living. Our job is not to convict. That responsibility lies solely with the Holy Spirit. Our job is to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to say, I know where you are at right now, and I'm going to choose to extend love to you anyways. If Jesus had looked to condemn us before the cross, he never would have gone to the cross. But he loved us enough to provide the sacrifice for our sins. So when Jesus encounters this scene and they ask him what they should do if they can stone her, he says, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. 
go and sin no more. Just very plainly this morning, if that's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for Jesus to look at a woman who has just been caught in the act of adultery and say, I'm not going to condemn you, go and sin no more, then how could I be any holier than Jesus? How could I have any level of self-righteousness that would look on them and say, well, honey, you really messed up. When, when you get your life together, then you come on back to church alive. Then, then you come on back to Family Sunday and we'll have a seat ready for you. After, you know, you need to get cleaned up a little bit. You need to go take a shower. You don't smell the greatest, honey. And then, then we'll get you into church on Sunday morning. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they smell like. I don't care what they were doing five minutes ago. The church is supposed to be a haven for those who are lost and hurting. And if Jesus can look on a sinner and say, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more, we are to do the same. But that is uncomfortable. Because our knee-jerk reaction is to provide judgment. Our knee-jerk reaction is to sit on a high tower and to be holier than thou and to recite all of the commands of Scripture and to want somebody to be cleaned up before they come. But Jesus tells us to love people right where they are. In another encounter with Jesus, a woman who was known to be a sinner and an adulterer entered the house where Jesus and some other religious leaders were having dinner. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and anoint him with precious fragrance. The scripture tells us in John 7 that one of the Pharisees thought to himself, if Jesus were a prophet, he would know that the woman touching him is a sinner. If Jesus was really the son of God, he would know that that woman is unclean. If Jesus were really a servant of God most high, he would know that that woman should not be anywhere near him. But I love how Jesus responds in Luke 7, starting in verse 40. Said, Jesus said to the Pharisee, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon said, teacher, tell me. Jesus said, two people owed money to the same banker. One owed 500 coins and the other owed 50. They had no money to pay what they owed. But the banker told both of them that they did not have to pay him. Which person will love the banker more? Simon the Pharisee answered, I think it would be the one who owed him the most money. Jesus said to Simon, you are right. Then Jesus turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I came into your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting, but she has been kissing my feet since I came in. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. I tell you that her many sins are forgiven, so she showed great love. But the person who is forgiven only a little will love only a little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The people sitting at the table began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, because you believed you are saved from your sins, go in peace. Jesus in this encounter was more concerned with loving the lost than he was about what the saved in the room thought about him. Jesus was more focused on loving an individual who was lost and hurting and was coming to the feet of Jesus. He was more concerned about ministering to her need than what the church was going to say or think about him. He was willing to go through the uncomfortability of having this woman who was known in the community to be an adulterer and a prostitute, to go through the uncomfortability of allowing her to wash his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair because it was in that encounter and interaction that her life was transformed, she was saved, her sins were forgiven, and she was welcomed into the kingdom of God. And it was in a moment of uncomfortability. I pray for myself that I will never 
miss an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus with someone who was lost because it looks uncomfortable. Because it looks to be out of the norm. Because it looks a little bit too inconvenient. I, I don't have time to do that today. Or what will people say about me if they see me with that individual? What will Jesus say about us if we look at that individual and keep walking by? We have a responsibility to get uncomfortable in our Christianity and love the lost right where they are. What would it look like if as a church, and this isn't even in the notes, but what would it look like if we as a church found out where an LGBTQI plus event was going to be held and we went there just to love the people? Just to say, Jesus loves you. Just to say, there is a church where you can come. Not that we're going to condone the lifestyle, because we're not. That's not the type of church that we are. But what would it look like if we actually went to where the sinners were actively gathering, and we said, Jesus loves you? That is uncomfortable. There's probably some people that are squirming even now in the pew, but that's the type of Jesus that we serve. That's the type of Savior that we serve, that he would look on the sinner and he would say, go and sin no more. You are forgiven. Lastly, this morning, we must engage in the discomfort of living generously. You'll be familiar with this passage because I've read it often in the last year and a half, but Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 it says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Verse 45, this is what I want us to grab this morning. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I'm always amazed by the early church in this passage of Scripture because it identifies so many rich things that the church is supposed to do. But in verse 45, it says they shared or they sold their property, and shared their possessions with everyone who was in need. That sounds uncomfortable to me. I don't know about you, but I'm not typically waking up in the morning saying, Lord, what do you want me to get rid of today to give to somebody else? What possession do you want me to sell today, Lord, to meet somebody else's physical need? But that is exactly what the early church was doing. They did not regard their physical and earthly possessions as actually belonging to themselves. They regarded them as belonging to the Lord. And so it was not difficult for them to release and to sell their property and their possessions and to be able to give financially to those who were in need. And Scripture tells us very clearly, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They didn't debate about what God was doing. They were simply disobedient, or they were simply obedient, sorry. And there had to be some discomfort in selling their possessions to give to those in needs. But the Lord blessed them. And this morning, I can preach this part of the sermon and this passage of Scripture knowing that this is a generous church. In the last, what we've been here now, 16 months, 17 months, there has never been a need that this church has had that this body of believers has not met. There has never been a need in our community that we have sought to meet that you all as faithful members and congregants have given sacrificially to meet. However, I never want to get so comfortable with our generosity that we fail to continue to study what the Bible has to say about money. Because to do this would to be the, to run the risk of becoming too tight with the finances 
that God has blessed us with. It would be to run the risk of becoming so comfortable in our giving habits that we never actually allowed the Holy Spirit to prompt us to greater generosity. The early church had no restrictions on what they were willing to give or sell for the kingdom of God to advance. And as believers today, it is sometimes easy to believe that our financial security is a result of our own achievements rather than the blessings of God. But we must have a reminder this morning that every financial blessing that we have received, every aspect of financial security that we have is a gift from God. Scripture tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. The, the financial security that we have as individuals and as a church is a direct testimony to the blessing and the favor of God on our lives. And if we were to ever get into a season where we fail to continue to live generously, then we would remove ourselves from the blessings of God. And this is more than just tithing. Tithing is honoring God with our first fruit, our, that first 10% that goes back to God. But generosity is saying that God has blessed me with more than I need or deserve, so I choose to give out a, of a place of abundance and obedience to the word of God. This is a mentality that says what I possess does not belong to me. I am simply a steward of what I have right now. And you may be thinking, Pastor Stetson, I give a little extra here and a little extra there. I'm talking about generosity. I'm talking about giving when it doesn't make sense. I'm talking about an abundance of giving, making that sacrifice and trusting in God that he will manage the finance as well. If your giving habits never cause you any discomfort, you're not giving the way God calls us to. The early church sold their possessions and their property. This was not comfortable, but it led to blessings. This last week, Miranda and I put our house in Jeffersonville on the, the market. Many of you are aware that we're building a new home in Charlestown just a few minutes away from where we currently live in preparation for our expanding family. And we purchased this home in 2020 and we purchased it for $111,000. And we were very blessed with the finances to be able to do that and we have taken good care of that home. But for the last four and a half years, we have been obedient to the Lord with our finances. And I'm not saying any of this to make you think, well, Pastor Stetson is just so holy and so generous. I'm doing this to give glory to God. Because as we prepared to put our house on the market, Miranda and I had a very specific prayer that we put before the Lord. We prayed, God, let it sell in 24 hours. Let it sell for above asking price and do exceedingly abundantly more than we could even ask or imagine. We wanted to cover all of our bases because there was some stuff we didn't even know to pray for. So we put our, our house on the market 8 a.m. Monday morning. Had seven showings of our house on Monday. By that evening, we had four offers. And by Tuesday morning, we had accepted an all-cash offer for $197,000. $86,000 more than we paid for this house four years ago. And when my realtor called me to tell me the offers that we had received, he said, this is unheard of. You guys must be doing something right in life. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, let me just make this very clear. This is serving the Lord. This is a house covered in prayer. This is tithing to the Lord. I said, don't make any mistake. This is not a fluke. This is not a consequence. This is God. This has to be God. 
the sale of our home will set a record in our neighborhood for price per square foot. Nothing has gotten as high of a price as our house is getting. You cannot convince me that that is not God. And again, I, I'm not saying any of this to bring any attention or any credit to Stetson and Miranda. What I'm doing is to give glory back to Jesus. Because there have been some times over the last four and a half years where the Lord prompted us to do something with our finances, and it was tight. But we wanted to trust in the Word of God. We wanted to be obedient to what He was asking us to do. We wanted to live generously, understanding that obedience to His Word brings about freedom and it brings about blessing. And the Lord reminded me this week that every single time that we have been obedient is now coming back to us in blessing. That all of the times that we have given in obedience and generosity, He is blessing us even now in this, and it gives glory back to Jesus. That is what uncomfortable Christianity looks like. That is what serving the Lord with faithfulness looks like. So this morning, I want to encourage you to press into living in an uncomfortable Christianity. And normally, I would give an opportunity for us to come to the altar and pray, but my phone went off at the same time all of your phones went off, that we are now under a severe thunderstorm warning. Um, and so I want to be sensitive to what is going on around us and conclude our service so that we can be wise and careful in the, the storms that may be coming in. So I'm going to pray over us and I'm going to bless us, and then um, we will check on the weather forecast before. Um, I mean, if you want to leave, you can, but um, we'll make sure that we're in a, a safe area to be able to dismiss and get out of church so that everybody is safe today. Father God, we thank you for your presence and your spirit this morning. We thank you for your word that prompts us to uncomfortable Christianity. We thank you, Father, for the promise that when we're obedient to your word, it gives us freedom and it gives us blessing. I pray, Father, that you would help each of us to be obedient to your word in the days and weeks, months and years to come, that we would press into the uncomfortability of Christianity and that we would see your kingdom come and your will be done in our church, in our lives, our families, and our communities. And we ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Amen and amen. To the regions beyond, I must go, I must go, where the story has never been told. To the millions that never have heard of his love, I must tell the sweet story of old. To the regions beyond, I must go. I must go till the world, all the world, his salvation shall know. There are other lost sheep that the master must bring, and they must the message be told. He sends me to gather them out of all lands and welcome them back to his fold. To the regions beyond, I must go, I must go till the world, all the world, his salvation 
nation shall know to the regions beyond I must go I must go till the world all the world is salvation shall know to the regions beyond I must go I must go